Hey guys, what's going on? Welcome to another uh, episode of Illustration Masterclass. Today we're looking at the artist Gustavo Pelissari. I'm going to be including all of this guy's work in the description box below if you want to check him out or follow him. Uh, before we jump into this, I do want to make a quick announcement, which is that my Patreon membership that I've mentioned before uh, is now currently open. And I'm going to include my Patreon link in the description box. Uh, for those that are interested in one-on-one -on -one mentorships where we meet weekly and I go over your work and, uh, and help you improve your technique and, and uh, do drawovers on how it is that you can improve, similar to the ones it is that I do in this master class, uh, you can check out your options in the Patreon link below. I've got two different options. One of them is to meet uh, twice a month for $150 a month. I mean, uh, for $150 a month, uh, meet twice a month uh, for one hour each. And we uh, draw over your work and, and we discuss how it is that you can improve your, your technical abilities. And then we have uh, the other option, which is to meet four times a month for $300. Uh, so with that said, we're going to go ahead and jump in and, and take a look at what it is that we can learn uh, from Gustavo here. And uh, so the first thing I want to mention about this is, is that there is, this is done digitally which is something it is that I wasn't expecting when I looked at this guy's work. Uh, what's interesting about this is, is that he is using some sort of textured paper in the background here, which I really, really like. And it definitely adds a lot to his illustrations. Because as you'll see in the finished illustration style that he works in, uh, it's pretty unique for a digital artist to be able to have the kind of finish that this guy does. Uh, it's not the sort of thing it is that you would see in most uh, digital, digital artists, uh, digital fantasy artists. Most of them have the same kind of dark fantasy aesthetic, uh, Magic the Gathering kind of look. But anyway, as far as the compositional elements of what it is that I see here, uh, a lot of it is very, very subtle. Uh, subtle use of converging lines. Uh, notice that this is intersecting directly at the head, right? And by when I'm pointing at this specifically, if we go in and we look right here at this bottom hilt, right? When we follow it all the way through, we see it intersects on the bottom third of the face, right? It actually intersects with his mouth. So we can actually take that more up. And we could say it's not, it doesn't carry through directly that way. But regardless, we can see that the general arc of this sword, it, it intersects with the face, which is basically our main focal point. Our main focal point is always going to be the head when it comes to the figures, right? Uh, we can also see some converging lines going on here in the shield. It doesn't seem like it at first, but we see this line right here, right? And this line pretty much bisects the, um, the shield itself. And if we follow it, it basically comes up and converges into this line that again takes us to the head, right? Um, so it's very important that he didn't, uh, you know, not that it would be wrong, but it, it's important that he didn't have the sword laying this way, because if he had the sword laying this way, then we, we would be losing some of the detail of the sword, and the illustration would probably still work, right? Um, but it still makes more sense for us to see the entire sword, right? And this is a way for him to put the sword completely in the picture without having to push it off the page and without having to make the character smaller. So he does a really good job with positioning the character in the image itself. And you can even see here some sketched lines of where he kind of drew a box 
of where it is that this character might stand, right? Which is something that if if you're having problems with positioning your characters, that's something to consider, right? So let's look at the actual rendered image of this real quick. So this is the rendered image of it. And it looks like he adjusted, he adjusted a couple of different things. If we flip back and forth between the two, uh, we see that texture, that texture of the color, it's still there. It's still bleeding through whatever that, whatever that paper texture he's using as a background, it's still there. Uh, and it seems like he's, he's doing things in a grayscale and then he's coming back over and he's drawing on top of it with this colored technique, which is really interesting, right? And he's able to create a really interesting effect. And of course, our focal point is going to be the head, like I mentioned before, right? And so what is he, how is he supporting that aspect, right? Well, again, this goes right back to what I was saying before. If we follow the hilt right here, we follow that all the way through to the other side where the sword is. Um, it still isn't lining up perfectly all the way through, but it does look like he adjusted it a little bit and it does intersect with the mouth. Um, but you could think of this as one big, one big converging line that's keeping your eye focused in on here. And he's obviously supporting this with making this contrast between this green, this very dull green and this uh, bright red. So he has these two contrasting colors right next to one another. And this red is basically creating a frame that is holding this green shape, which is the head, right? And then we see touches of that red here, and here, here. We see that, we see that all here. And then of course the green on the hands but everything except for the red and the green on his face, everything else is is in a subdued uh, color scheme. So if we if we take this and we drop this into a grayscale, we see very quickly how much the red really brings out the face because even though uh, the face is still coming out of the of the background of the rest of the shapes around it because of its lighter value uh, the red really helps push it forward and it shows that just because this right this red feels very bright whenever we actually look at it on a value scale it's actually pretty close in value to the hair itself, right? Like they're pretty close. Which is interesting, which is interesting to realize about color, right? Just because something looks bright doesn't mean that it necessarily has a light value to it. But you have this you have this dark shape in the background, which is creating this interesting silhouette around this lighter shape, which is the face, right? And then he's got all this other detail down here in the in the shield, which is great. Let's go ahead and let's move on to the next one. All right, so this is this next part is just going to be going through and looking at one illustration and the different iterations it is that he has posted on on his art station for this, right? 
So uh, if we look at this, this is one of his initial sketches that he has. And let's take a look. Let's just quickly go through these four iterations and see how it is that he came to the conclusion that he came to. All right, so this is his first iteration. This is another iteration. Okay. This is the penciled version. Again, this is all done uh, digitally. So I guess I shouldn't say penciled. But this is all done digitally. And then this is the final, which is absolutely gorgeous, right? So we can look at this in terms of, first off, what was, what was possibly the brief that he was given? Well, he was given the brief of uh, these warriors riding on the back of this dinosaur. And they're riding either into battle or something along those lines, right? In this one, to me, this, this feels like this is in the middle of battle. So he may have he may have drawn this like this seems like maybe there's some guys down here that are like running out of the way. Looks like there's a guy here, there's a guy here that he penciled in. That are they're kind of running out of the way. It's completely it feels much more like a dynamic image. Um, this one feels much more it feels almost abstract in a sense. I mean, it's still got a narrative quality to it, um, but it feels uh, less like there's a battle going on and more like this is preparing for something to happen, right? This feels like this is in the middle of the battle. It feels like he's about to hit something. He's about to ram into something, right? So if we just take out this one and we look at these design decisions, even here, he still hasn't made all the design decisions yet that will sell the illustration, but for the most part, he has, right? What are the main design decisions that he's made? Well, when we pull back out of this illustration, we look at it from a distance, we can see very clearly uh, the silhouette of the character, right? And we have this nice swooping, let me create my layer here. We have this nice swooping line that's going up and it's going like this, right? And it's even going through the top. And we can see that even the gestures and the lines, the converging lines, are all pointing us in this general direction. We can see he's sketched in a line, possibly of like a cliff behind here, that will keep us framed around this, this figure. Um, but even these gesture lines, they're pointing up, they're pointing up, this right here is pointing up, this as well, right? And uh, the gestures of the legs itself are going up. Everything is basically framing, and, and this, even though this is going up like this uh, and it seems to not be converging with the rest of the lines and where these lines are pointing, uh, it's still creating a frame, right? It's keeping your eye uh, from going off this way. And we see that with the pterodactyl as well. Uh, the pterodactyl is flying in, in formation behind him and it's basically pointing us uh, to what's going on here on the back. And as we zoom in on the piece, we see more of the story taking place. And so let's look at the, the value structure, okay? So now we're looking at it from a value structure perspective and things become even clearer the way it is that things are organized, right? Because now, if we're just looking at it in terms of the values that he's putting down, and by that I mean the 
dark tones, the mid tones, and the light tones. How is he organizing this, right? He has this very strong light tone in the background here, which is this big white shape that's coming in here, right? This big shape back here. And that allows him to make this darker, significantly darker, and significantly more complex shading of this head here, right? Because it allows him to create a really dynamic looking silhouette of this dinosaur head. And it looks really, really cool, you know? We imagine if, if he tried to put this, but then he tried to put something that was of the same value as this behind here, uh, it wouldn't work. The, the silhouette would not be as readable. And so when we zoom in, we get to see all the cool detail. And this creates a natural contrast, right? We want to, we want to draw our attention of the viewer to one specific place and that specific place we're going to put the most amount of contrast and the most amount of detail right so a beginner might look at something like this and you ask them well where's the most amount of detail and they might say well there's a lot of detail here there's a lot of detail here there's a lot of detail here and there's a lot of detail here but that would be missing the point uh, yes, there is detail here, um, and there's detail all throughout this piece, uh, but it's, it's about where's the highest point of contrast, okay? The highest point of contrast is here. There's no doubt about it. Um, there's, very, there's contrast here between this shape here in the foreground and these background shapes, but as you'll see in the final piece, it's not as much as there is here in, the, in this region of the image, right? Um, everything around this is being used to support just creating this part of the image, which is the most dramatic part of the image. So let's go ahead and let's look at the final piece again. Okay, and now we can see exactly what it is that I'm talking about. That contrast of detail versus no detail is now supported with uh, his color choices, right? So we have these very cool shadows, very cool, very cool, right? And then he's got this warm background with the yellows and the blues, the yellows and the oranges, I mean. And this back over here, again, we can see that there's not as much contrast. In the sketch, it seems like there's a lot of contrast here, right? There's a lot of contrast between here and here. But in the finished piece, in terms of value, there is contrast here, but not as much. And in terms of color and in terms of color temperature, there's not as much contrast either because this is very cool and this is very cool, right? And then he's using these warm colors here to push this forward. Uh, and the same thing goes here with with the character itself, with this dinosaur itself, right? And then as we get closer, we, we see a lot of different things going on here, which, which make it really interesting. There's a lot of different things going on, right? There's a lot of uh, drama in seeing these different characters basically uh, writing on this, writing on this um, dinosaur. Uh, but we also see something very curious, which is that he uses these warm colors, but then he contrasts them against these blues. Um, 
putting colors together like this that contrast next to one another, uh, it gives your image this kind of vibrancy, which is very difficult to explain. But when you pull back and you look at this image and you just, you, you can feel it. You can feel that he's really paying attention to the direction of the brush stroke. Um, you know, that's what it is and I meant when I, when I said that his style is very unique compared to most of the fantasy artists it is that I see. Because most of the fantasy artists it is that you see, they have this very highly detailed, highly rendered aesthetic going on. Uh, whereas this guy, his stuff is, it's almost impressionistic in some ways. You know, he, he has this very detailed rendered figure of the dinosaur. But the background, um, it starts to take on an abstract impressionist or Van Gogh uh, type feel to it, which, which makes it feel very fresh. And he's putting these colors right next to one another. And that, that contrast is giving the colors a kind of vibrancy. Uh, because when you put two colors next to one another that contrast against one another, uh, they help bring out the essence of each other's color, right? That's what contrast is. You put a blue next to an orange, and the blue helps bring out the orange, and the orange, and the orange helps bring out the blue and the blue. And so that's what you're seeing in this image here. Um, so anyway, this this image is masterfully done. I think I've I think I've kept you guys long enough. This is 20 minutes, no, 22 minutes. Uh, like I mentioned before, I'm putting this guy's information in the description box below, if you'd like to check out more of his work. And like I said, I have uh, Patreon tutorials and things like that that you can that you can watch, uh, as well as my podcast episodes will be going up earlier on my Patreon from now on. Um, so I have the Bobby Rebels, uh, Rebholtz interview now available to watch a week ahead of time uh, for, for the $5 uh, Patreon subscribers. And that just means you get um, more tutorials like this um, and uh, some printable stuff. I have like printable fan art of Metal Gear Solid that I have that you can download through my Patreon as well. Um, and more tutorials and different things like that, my comics. A lot of those things will be f uh, available at the $5 tier on my Patreon, uh, whereas the mentorships will be available at the higher uh, paid Patreon uh, tiers. So if you're interested in that, please feel free to check that out. Uh, and make sure to check out Gustavo's work as well. Give him a follow on social media. And thank you guys for watching, and uh, take care.